So I have another special guest, Mr. Laurie McGinley, who's a UEFA B licensed coach. Recently, he was the head coach of the University of West of Scotland, and he also owns his own coaching company called McGinley Coaching. Laurie has coached at under 13, 15, 17, 19, 21, and 23 level, and he's done a lot in football, and we will know about a, a, a bit more about him. So welcome on the show, Laurie. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Why don't you tell us what your journey has been like so far? Yeah, well, thank you again for uh, inviting me. I know it's taken a bit of time to get a time and a place, but we're so busy with the uh, life uh, journey. Uh, I loved football from a young age, uh, brought up in a football family. Uh, grandfather took me to a lot of football um, games and kind of introduced me to, you know, the Rangers Celtic rivalry and the Scottish rivalry and how amazing football is. But really, the biggest thing I've learned is um, you can turn every advantage into every sort of every disadvantage into an advantage. Um, we probably come on to it, but when I was ten years old, uh, I had a uh, violent cavitis, so I had meningitis in the brain. I was very ill. Uh, I shouldn't really be talking to you. I should be should be alive, but things happen. And uh, you know, the the biggest thing I'm learning is if you put your mind to it and also have trust in people to do their job and you can do it and I was so thankful but from that uh, I got a uh, maybe about 10 years later I got uh, an opportunity to play with Scotland uh, the Scottish uh, Disability Football Team or the CB team uh, I was a bit skeptical at first because uh, just wasn't sure you get opportunities like this when you don't you don't see this very often but got an opportunity to play and yeah I already I was a very good I love to run I love to sprint I was always very active anyway so I used a lot of my skill set already and uh, I came up to the first training session and I'm thinking, wow, this is amazing. You get hit, you get everything, you get treated like a professional. So, but again, 18, 19, quite young, quite naive. So I didn't really know what to do at training and the quite head coach just said to me, just do what you want, right? do what you can and see how good you are. You know, and then uh, I think uh, because I was a reasonably good player, I think I beat six or seven players and scored and the head coach was like, Oh, it's going to be quite fun, you know, to work with you because I had I had pace, but I also knew how to um, keep myself reasonably fit and also use my, you know, football knowledge. But from that, uh, top ten players in the world, being at European Championships, uh, World Cups qualifiers, as part of the Paralympic um, team, but I missed out just uh, in the last two, and then basically from there got my degree and. I just really not look back. I've always looked at football coaching. You know the the you see I love the 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 football coaching, but the sports science, the analytics, the the director of coach, director of football, the kind of different roles that are needed. But I've always had this love to be a role. A lot of things, a lot of things, just as part of my my nature. But also let people talk to me, learn how to deal with different scenarios. So I love being a head coach. I love being a head of you know, uh, head with club development. So I can get advanced things, help people, you know, with develop programs. But yeah, the coaching journey has been probably 17, 18 years. But coaching, as I said, you probably meant the younger ones also coach first team level too. And it's all about every day. You, you're you not, nobody's an expert. I don't think it's, it's one thing. You're always learning every day a new idea and a new way to talk to someone or how to deal with scenarios. And I think we're all just, and every journey is different. We're all very much in the same journey to A, to develop players, B, to develop ourselves, and C, just to get the best out of the the scenario you're in. So, again, it's all about working with what you've got so you therefore you can develop that programme and the, the players to make them better, but also make the club that a little bit better and improve yourself by 1%. Well, you have had some phenomenal experiences in football, and I must reiterate that you were amongst the top 10 players in the world when you played for Scotland's disability team. So that kind of labels you as an international, former international footballer. So can you tell us more about your experience as, you know, playing for the Scotland disability team, as well as something that I really want to know about, that traumatic brain injury that you had in your younger days? Yeah, so as I mentioned before, I was a... Uh, uh, I was very ill, but the 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 biggest thing I, I learned from this uh, experience when I played was the professionalism, the standards, the keeping yourself that kind of way of 
ticking over, but also making sure that you're 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 fit, you're strong, and you know how to develop yourself in a football field. You know, but like an example would probably be when um, I got uh, into trouble because see my um, I basically I had the right fit, the right, but my shirt, my t-shirt was untucked, and it looked unprofessional. You know, and that's then and I got into trouble for that. But it was because the standard was so high. But then you've got like I, I one thing I always remember Alex Ferguson saying, being on time is late. So every team meeting, it was a half eleven meeting, we get there at quarter past, twenty past latest, ten minutes because when you go to meetings like you travel or you go, you can you can only control the controllables. I, if you control yourself in a way if you keep yourself right, then you're gonna be it at the top. But you know, the experience of playing on pitches that are not so good to the, the the best of the best pitches and you learn as an international footballer that you do you, you have to you play against similar players because you meet them most of the time and you can put and the biggest thing we love to compare ourselves to other people and we're actually like when you're I think the biggest thing is well off the field I was very friendly with a lot of the, the players but on the field there was no there was not a lot of friends it was very much rivalry but you keep that professionalism because even if I was dropped for a game, the in the warm up I was one hundred percent. So therefore, it would match intensity, match prep. So therefore, you know, let's say one of the players got injured after five ten minutes, or the coach went to the gym, I was ready to go. And uh, I always remember just the biggest thing is you can be disappointed, which is a natural reaction. You know, if you get dropped for a game, but instead of moaning or complaining about it, you go in and do the warm up. You do what you can because. You never know what's going to happen in that game. You could be the person who comes in for the last five minutes or you could be the person who comes in for 50 minutes. But when you learn that, you know, my, my disab- I don't really have, I've got a hidden disability, you would call it, uh, and it's very, uh, I can control it. But the biggest thing I'm learning is you every tournament I went to, I was in very, very good shape. I learned, I did the, uh, all the prep work, you know, set plays, I, I memorise them all. But the biggest thing is you you learn when you get older how to prep more about the, the, the importance of stretching, the importance of relaxation, the importance of training at a high intensity, but also the the um, hydration, you know, when you're struggling. Talk to the, the coaches. Like, I remember I was struggling to get, I was just a bit off form. I asked one of the coaches, um, to we basically got a bag of footballs and we went out at seven o'clock in the morning before our training session and I must have just I wanted to I just my technique wasn't right and it just he just gave me the same um training session you know like uh, it was crossing because I was I played it as a right centre back but I was also a winger too and it was just crossing 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 and finishing and I was just getting that repetition but sometimes if you force something it doesn't work if you just I think it's the the expression you know. If you have class, it's always permanent, but temp, you know, your form is temporary. Sometimes you just need a little bit of a kick up, you know, the, the backside to say, you know what, let's get let's get it sorted. And having that mindset of, I know where I want to go, but how do I get there? And it's an extra hour training or an extra bit of information. But again, from a head injury, you know, you, you don't expect to be called up for Scotland, but also you don't expect to be the top 10 players in the world. But again, that was the biggest thing of learning was if you work hard, you get somewhere. If you work extra hard, you will get there. But it's sometimes it's just the the difference. I always remember Simon Sinek, and there's the five percent, uh, the top five percent, and the uh, and then you get the ninety five to hundred percent. Then the people are in the kind of ninety percent. It's always they're working hard. They might not achieve something. They're not achieving yet. So why can't we get? And when I played, I didn't expect to be in the top 10. But I also didn't expect to play, if, you know, play for the, the tournament, you know, but I did. But that was hard work, you know, the, in the gym, going to play uh, football with a team, going to play fives, going to do things that maybe I didn't like to do. I was in, I finished a 10 hour shift and I went to the gym, you know, did my, my cardio. So therefore, having that mindset of, I don't want to say, when you die, you know, because I did die in the operating theatre three times, I was told, to get told that you might not walk to play with your countries. Again, it's an honour to play with your country, but it's an even bigger honour to basically just play football because a lot of people don't have the, uh, might not have the chance to play football. 
due to different reasons, you know, financial and social, but just using the power of football and the power of sport to get themselves in the, out in the street or get themselves into a team or stuff will help the, you know, the, the, the young people and also older people, um, you know, develop themselves through, kind of, as I said, different programmes. Right. So I think these are some some powerful tips on on grit and dealing with adversity. So now part of your experience is you've held several head coach positions. So what have each of these experiences taught you to, you know, shape your own coaching philosophy or philosophy for the future? Uh, that sometimes you, you think you're the best coach in the world when you're not. That's the thing. A lot of people like have, uh, you, you go in with one approach and then it's a completely different team to go. So the biggest thing is uh, when we go in as a head coach is you. it's all about adapting to the the environment you're in, but having your way of thinking. You know, like I've got, I, I remember I put a hundred page document together, and it was it was different diagrams, different bit, but it was a very general. Now I, I've learned over the years how if I wanted a certain style, then you need to study that style, but also study different things that are going to happen. But as a head coach, you need to be on the on the, on the ball all the time. But you need to be learning how to deal with the uh, the board, the you know upper management, also dealing with staff, how to deal with players, how to deal excuse me, with um, different you know um, scenarios. But also, it depends on uh, everyone thinks or oh, head coaches at the adult level when you can be the best under twelves grassroots coach you know in the region. So. This is the biggest thing. You, if you're a head coach, you are helping the per- the people around you. You know, like the parents, the, the the kids. But you learn that sometimes if you if you you could be an expert, you know, or a person who's experienced working with younger children, go and work with them and be the person, be the best. But go and see if your skill set is working with under nines, and you try and do the same skill set as under nineteens. Slightly, it's obviously it's different because of physical age and also. Um, maturity, but you learn that sometimes you have to have the skill set to adapt, be a chameleon, and also just learn that there's going to be. Uh, I remember Sir Alex Ferguson, I know he's uh, the person I talk to about a lot, but he says, choose your owner, not the, the club. Because if you choose the owner, you know, obviously there's people who are privileged to have that, you know what I mean? But the biggest thing is having that research, you know, going to go to a club in a, like, for example, different clubs. In Scotland and England, but if you want to work in the women's game, you know, can you go and uh, speak to the sport director of the women's side? Can you go and speak to the head of the recruitment? Because they might, you might have a, a network that's there, but you need to maybe speak to them about, I'm interested in this uh, vacancy. Cool. So what skills do you have? Oh, I've got ABC. Well, we're looking for A, B, C, D, E. So D and E is what we're looking to, for you to do. But maybe in two years' time, if you continue your skill set and your learning, then the you will develop. You know, like I stepped away uh, from uh, my recent role for family reasons. You know, like I, I've taken, I've got an eighteen month old, but I, I'd rather. Sometimes it's great doing all this work, but at the end of the day, see if you if you've got if you're doing it for something is not that important. Then sometimes it is just a bit of a drag. Sometimes it's a wee bit of hard work when you don't need it and something. Having that refresh the batteries maybe a month away, three months away, a year away. People take five years away, but they're still incredible coaches, still incredible at what they do. Head coaches might want to take a five-year gap or a three-year gap or something. They might not want to go into the coaching. They might want to be a sporting director or studying, but we'll always have to be respectful of why people leave jobs and also what's the thing. To go back to your point of being a head coach, you need to just it's all about adaptability, but making sure that you are the, the right person for the right club, right. but also make sure that you have your philosophy, your methodology, but it links. There's going to be certain things that you don't agree with, but you have to make it, it's all about compromise, and then you compromise a bit more, a bit more, you know, then you get more freedom as a coach to develop yourself. Well, so you are very passionate about elevating your coaching skills. You do a lot of courses, a lot of workshops, like the one you, the scouting one you did recently. 
Now we all want to improve as coaches, but then maybe we may not have the time. We may not really be bothered to do it. So what drives you to constantly, you know, improve yourself by undertaking so many courses and workshops? Well, time. You said uh, there's a, the biggest thing is uh, I, look, I look at it every week for my, my iPhone and my uh, time and I'm down. I do. I think I'm average about an hour and 20 minutes a day. But that's because I do my, I don't, I read. But this, the thing is, people see this is you, you, everyone looks at their, their phone or something and they may just, and it's just constant scrolling. And there's nothing wrong with that. This is the thing, there's nothing wrong with CPD. Some people like to do that if they continue their, their learning about different ideas. But like, I, when I have, if I have to travel for half an hour, a, a podcast on just related to what I'm looking at, like, I don't. I, like I, I've made, you know, I, I, I want to work in the women's game because it's, I think my skill set is better. But it's again the I le- I'm listening to a lot of the the women's football coaching podcast. But I listened to um, a Saul Isaac first. He talked about with a Jao a trial, and he talked about the the different parts of the youth development. So you can learn in the men's game and the women's game. So don't focus yourself on one pathway, but like. On my left hand side, you, there's about 200, sort of 400 books. Uh, about, I would say, 200 of them are The rest of them are, are mindset books, but uh, psychological, there's um, coaching manuals. But then you've got, um, I would say, like, not not everyone is a football one. Maybe uh, you could do with, uh, like, um, what are we looking at here? Like Billy Connolly, you know, like how to deal with different ideas, ideas to, like uh, you've got, like I was listening, I was reading um, Danny Cipriani in the rugby world. So you, you can learn from actors, you can learn from people. Like I love the high performance podcast because it's not just football. It's about people that are super communicators to people that are uh, who are a uh, no uh, get very low and then they get increase themselves, increase themselves. Like people who are not famous, they are famous now, but the. You can always, I always say, if you can spend one hour a day on your CBD, you know, twi- I, I, I go for a walk, you know, and of course people have children, people have got jobs, but you can always make half an hour on a podcast. You can always see reading at night, like I turn my, my phone off at uh, nine o'clock at night uh, because I don't want any social channels. I don't want, but I'll read, you know, and it's like I'm reading um, something to do with Formula One, but it's a different way of thinking of leadership but you can learn in so many different ways you know like I, you, you said that scouting and recruitment well as a head coach you need to learn how to recruit you need to learn how to scout you need to learn how to do video analysis you need to, because you could be the, the coach that has a very little a, a, a limited budget but you could you you're the only it could be you an assistant coach a goalkeeper coach a physio it's four of these you know and then if you're the head coach and you you're relying on an analyst or you're relying, you're not going to get it. You have to think outside the box for these things, like go to college, go to university, do a, a presentation. You may get some interns in, again, using the experience I have of being club development officers and you learn to in, uh, improve yourself, but also learn how to deal with different education uh, mm. courses. You know, but you learn that the biggest thing is time. Can you make 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour of CPD. Like one of the best quotes I've ever been given was um, it was a guy called Jamie Alterton, and he says, People struggle to read 30 books in a year, but if you read one chapter a day for the year, you could read a 10 chapter book 10 days. You could, uh, and then if you do that over a year, you probably get 40, 50, 60 books. But if you set yourself a, like a really unrealistic target, you know, I've set myself a, a target 60 books. That I read every three or four to five days, you know, so I can read a book. But that's because I prioritize sometimes the learning. But like, but, but sometimes you've got like, um, if I've got my son and he's unsettled and all that, and it's hours and hours and hours, that's the priority. First, then your education. We you always can spend 10 minutes, 20 minutes. As I said, you can go for a walk for a podcast, and you've got physical exercise, and also you've got. You've got improved your knowledge, and then therefore you come back, feel refreshed, and then you go back to maybe a normal life, which is normal sometimes. But you have to learn that it's just the best way to do things is actually just research, 
what you're looking to do, ask about it, speak to the people who have done the co- the have did the courses, and then if it's worth your money or your time, because it is money and time. Because uh, if you spend a hundred pound on a course and it's not very good, then you feel that uh, you've been oh, I do I do education when you spend thirty pound on a course and it's again there's a lot of free content out there. Go on modern soccer coach. There's he Gary puts out weekly um things on YouTube. You've got a podcast. You could spend hours and hours and hours educating yourself, which is a good thing, but it also could be hinder you because if you go down different rabbit holes, then, you, then you've got you need to have a clear way of thinking, but also having that adaptability. But you can't think on oh, like this and then go like that and then think of every scenario when you just need to look at uh, okay, what that in your one day I want to work as your head coach, women's game, elite level. Who do I need to speak to? Who can I go and network with? Who can I go into? What conference can I go to? What event can I go to? Again, don't put yourself into a tunnel, but also don't put yourself into the ocean. You know, the, one of the best quotes I've, uh, I've learned uh, was I was listening to when I did a podcast with someone was, uh, don't boil the ocean, boil the kettle. So basically what I meant was do one task at a time. Don't try and do a hundred tasks when you're not focused on one. Focus on one task, make it the best you can. And don't do things for the sake of it, just to pick a box. You know, like I do a lot of CPD work that I don't promote because it's not part of it. But this I do it for the sake of learning, but also the sake of oh, that's interesting. I like that. Um, I don't really like that, but I'm not going to look at that information. And yeah. sometimes you just you just go. It's not enough. To, it's not enough time to do it. Well, just for the audience, you do recommend quite a few good books on your Twitter on your X, which is yeah. Laurie McGinley one. So that's again that's a reference point for all the viewers. Now talking about podcasts, you have a podcast called The Curve Mindset which has had over 100 episodes so far. So can you tell us about the objective behind starting the podcast as well as, you know, what the entire experience has been like? Yeah, it was uh, me and uh, uh, one of my friends, Craig, we uh, we created it because we just thought this is actually a really good idea. I actually put something out on LinkedIn and he said he was interested in the mindset. He was doing a course on it. He's also a teacher. But he, um, due to a uh, family, a personal, uh, I think he, he, he dropped. He just couldn't commit to it anymore, so uh, I took over uh, after we had the discussion. And then, yeah, just basically, we look at everyone looked at uh, the same kind of podcast, you know, and we thought, how does mindset work with a lot of coaches? How do you deal with a um, high performance? How do you deal with? But we looked at people who are the elite level to the grassroots level, because in the day, you know, like you've got people who are if thousands and thousands of books, the people who have got. They've got maybe a hundred followers, but they've got so much information they want to give out. But the biggest thing you the objective is just to, it's actually being selfish, you know, and trying to learn from them, you know. But you you learn that in the podcast, if you if you just ask good questions, people will give you a good answer. But sometimes it's just about developing different ways to make sure that you're relevant because there's hundreds of podcasts out there. All right, mine just it is good. I think it's good because it's a different kind of podcast. But in the, the day, it's just it's just about making uh, spreading awareness about it, and also just making sure that if you are, if you want to talk about mindset, you know, because everyone's mindset is completely different. Uh, people talk about growth and fixed, but there's also you know, I think Simon Sinek talks about it. You know, infinite and finite mindset. You know, different kind of mindsets. It doesn't matter. You every day there's no you're not going to have a growth mindset for twenty four hours, but it's how you deal with things, how do you do with your emotion, how do you deal with controlling things, how do you control, um, how do you deal with uh, when things go wrong, and it's about learning that, in the podcast we talk about different scenarios, you know, how do you deal with um, coaching, how do you deal with players, how do you deal with staff, what their mindset on the different scenarios that they have to deal with. Right, absolutely. Um, you also, uh, amongst the hundred things that you do, you also have your own coaching business called McGinley Coaching. Now, I've noticed that a lot of coaches have begun to venture into starting their own coaching company. So, you know, over the years, you've had different experiences running a business in football coaching. So what advice do you have for people who are either planning to start their own coaching business or who are already into it but want to elevate? Oh. Win the lottery is one of the options, but uh, but uh, no, I think the biggest thing is you you need to be realistic. What 
what skills you have and what you can offer. But, uh, you know, I've taken mine to kind of part-time because there is a lot of financial pressure in the moment due to, you know, the, the, the cost of living. But sometimes you just need to take a punt on things and uh, sometimes you're backed into a corner. You need to do something that's going to make some money. But because I've coached and I've worked with the, the mini kickers to the, the youth, to the seniors, I've, you know, it's just showing my expertise. But sometimes... Uh, we we want to promote ourselves in a hundred ways, and sometimes the best way is actually just not. It's actually like speaking to the when you're working with the 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 young player, or they and they're they're actually getting better. You know, the parents telling you, yeah, their touch is better, or they're moving into space. That's the, that's the result. And they you know like you can promote yourself as a one to one coach. You can promote yourself. like I, I my I spoke to someone about this uh, a couple weeks ago. There's others. So many good one to one coaches out there. It, but the biggest thing is imagination and you know, working on the what they can do, you know, you know, what they can do, what can they do. You know, so you know, like I very much have like a bag of balls, a goal and uh, an objective. And you know, obviously there's a plan, you know, but like I I do some video work with some players, but sometimes it's just the best thing is just to show them different scenarios in the game. You know, like can you uh, move the ball the in, the inside channel can you cross the ball can you do this and you just have to learn that some of the kids just need a little bit of repetition but running your business is hard you know it is because you, you're the only one so I could be the only one who's doing things but you have to just go do you know what sometimes it's good to partner up with some, uh, other people and make sure that they can help you but you learn that sometimes it's good to step away and then maybe go back in with a different approach you know, like uh, I've got a couple of ideas I'm working on at the moment, but right now I- I'm focusing on, you know, the, the other jobs I'm doing and my, my business. But the learning is, you know, you learn sometimes to not walk away, but just step back, what, what, what's good, what's not so good. And then therefore you have that idea of, you know what, I'm really good at this, I'm not so good at that. But I've got a partner I might be good for this. So maybe in- include them but as a business owner, you, you're, it's all about basically making sure that you can survive, but also you're happy where you are. Where you are, and some people just are not happy where they are, so they just walk away, which is again it's completely up to them. But sometimes it's good to have the business in the background just in case you go back into it, you know, so therefore it's not lost. That's interesting. So how do you market your services to schools and you know bring on a few more one-to-one clients? Well, I just use uh, my social media some, but I'm actually very much. Uh, I just uh, I speak to different uh, parents, you know, of the, the the clubs I work at, you know, just to help out. Like I do some volunteering work, and I just get my card out. But a lot of the a lot of the stuff I do is I, I don't really market as much yeah. because the the proof is not actually the video. It's actually watching the player and saying he's actually or she's got really good. Uh, at that, so therefore the marketing is actually not. It's give you six weeks time, or it give you six months time. You need to you the market is actually the eyes on the player to make sure that they're getting better, and therefore you put, sometimes the social media has a false advertisement of some sort, which again has its pros and cons. But I think just working with the player, and making sure that they are working with you, they can develop themselves. So they are getting better. Then therefore, I think it better than a word of mouth, you know. And then if you have a word of mouth, then you become more, you know, uh, your reputation rises. But again, it's all very much all. As I said to you before, you're going to. You, some people are experts, some people are not. But the biggest thing we're all learning every day, and that's the biggest thing. Hundred uh, percent. Now I want to know your opinion. So, how would you determine success and failure in youth coaching? Uh. That, that it's a difficult one because success, I think the biggest thing we look at is when you look at success, people look at results, you know, like 20-0, 30 nil. There is, uh, I think, and then the, the failure is the person losing 20 nil. No, the success is actually when the the player for three years has got better and better and better and they improve themselves by 1%, 1%, 1%. Uh, but youth, the football, I think we we have to have a, a look at how we look at success, you know, from a holistical point of view and making sure that, that they're, they're happy. 
they're, they're excited, they're, they're, they're training, they are doing well. Also, the, there's, the failures is actually sometimes as coaches, we demand more than we should, we expect more than we should. When sometimes we need to look at ourselves as coaches and say, okay, what am I doing well? I'm a, what am I not, what am I not doing so well? You know, and then improving because at the end of the day, we're helping young uh, boys and girls out at a grassroots level to an elite level. And they're making sure that they're the number one priority. You know what I mean? And make sure we we know how to how to deal with the scenarios. You know, like I work with an under seventeen group, and I know that when I was working with the, I knew most of them are exams. How was your exam today? Oh, good. This person did what? Hi there. How you doing? Good. No, you don't need to. It's sometimes it's all about working, communicating the right way, but also having the success of building that relationship. And. You know, youth football is so variety, there's such a variety of different things that'll happen, but just making sure that they're playing football and enjoying football, and sometimes it's not the the score, it's actually just participating, you know, and we should really work at the community level to we should make sure that some people don't want to play football for you know the for the the competitive, but a different way competitive. So you have to just look at the success of basically a person turning up to training, a person turning up to the games, because again, it could be other issues, you know, at home or at school, so therefore you have to have that way of thinking. For sure, I mean, considering that so few in reality will actually become professional footballers, so giving that experience is definitely key. So now, uh, before I let you go, what are your future plans? Um, I think it's just more just to keep... Uh, doing what I'm doing and working hard to network but I was always uh, given this quote uh, walk once, think twice it was a really great quote because we always uh, promote ourselves on social media and go and make ourselves look like we are an expert at something when we're not, you know, there is as I said, there is experts and we learn from experts but the experts were learning from other experts so the biggest thing is my future plan is always just to improve myself, but also to make sure that I would, in one day, uh, as I said, I would love to, I think I've made this quite funny, I would one, I would love to win a Champions League in the women's side, but again, the the biggest thing is sometimes keeping quiet and just doing things in the background and working hard is the best way, and then networking, you know, and making sure that you're up to date with, you know what to do when there's different researchers out there, you know, talking to different coaches, the biggest thing you a future plan is something can happen tomorrow. So you have to make sure that you're happy today or tomorrow. You know, what you what you've done, what you're planning. You can't plan everyone wants to plan three years in advance and they've not planned they've not achieved something in the in that three years. So you have to look at it as a strategic, what have I done in a week? Cool, right? I've done this, this and this, cool. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. So you need to just look at it as, you know, what what am I doing better every day? To improve myself, and again, goes for anyone. If you're in, if your future plan is involved in something that you're, you're, you want to achieve, then achieve it, and then try again, try achieve it another way. You know, so therefore you're developing yourself. Yeah, you have to just make sure that in your future plan, you have to make that realistic to what you're looking to do. Great. So these were some great insights, and that brings us to the end of the podcast. I'd like to thank you for giving your time and, you know, giving us some fantastic viewpoints, which are going to definitely act as references for all the coaches watching. And yes, it's been brilliant having you. Oh, thanks again for having me.